I usually spend the days at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden, where, where one of the things I do is that I participate in, a, in uh, some well, moves to couple of research organizations that we call the Lotus Alliance. And one of the many things that we do is that we all foster the development and are part of the development of something we call the Lotus Toolkit. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit. So what we deal with in daily life is groups computing. That is, uh, this to be largely distributed system as well. I I'll, I'll guess how many of you are going to group computing? I'm going to a couple of you. So, yeah. uh, so I'm going to cover that a little bit more in detail. So I'll give you the picture of what group computing is and where it goes.
couple of examples of where grid computing are used today. Um, well, actually, the two bottom things that you know, said at home and distribute.net, they already existed when this came about, so they still have their own software stacks doing the same thing. But this is mostly, uh, I think you're aware of it, uh, you have these screen savers that when you don't use the computer, it contacts the server somewhere, participates by contributing some small chunk of work to the log, to a large effort. Search for extraterrestrial in a intelligence or cracking crypto algorithms or doing stock market analysis prediction what have you. Another example is CERN in Switzerland. They have a new they're building a new accelerator which will be even more powerful. Um, and it kind of it will go online in probably yes or now. It has four large detectors and I think you can see here, this is a full grown map. So these are huge. This is just solid iron and in huge detectors and they spit out gigabit per second of <coughs> output that we need to analyze and store. And uh, when they after they got money to build this whole thing, they started to think about what kind of computing and storage capacity do we need to handle all the data? And then they realized that that would be just as expensive as building this facility. So they couldn't really go back to their funders and ask for that. So they need another another solution. And the solution here is that like, everyone ships in the grid whatever resources they can collect locally at their own uh, at their own institutes as well. And at the end, so Share all these the all this data somewhere uh, in that data there is a uh, um, there's a trace of the of the final elementary particle that they haven't found yet. That they, what they hope to find out that will be a Nobel Prize for whoever has it. Um, so here we have a unique instrument with lots of data and uh, we have a distributed analysis of that data. We can also turn around the whole thing. This is an uh, example uh, from the United States where they have an earthquake engineering um, uh, project. And here, they, well, this is a bad slide, but I have stolen it. Um, but essentially what they have here is they have sensory networks that are out in the various rifts, sensing seismic um, activity. They feed the, that into sensory networks and they provide that as input to large shape tables that, like that you can see up on the top. Those are huge things that we can put the three-story building on and shape it around. <laughs> And of course, you have to uh, combine this with data recovery or analysis or computing or simulation. And eventually, this all comes so complex that you want to find a fine web browser based interface to the whole thing. Um, so, this is some seven or eight different institutes that are participating and researchers, and they share data and access and whatever. We can also go into the commercial world. Uh, SAP, which you may know, they use our, um, they showcased a, a demo quite recently where they have are building on top of the Globus Toolkit 2 for various um, internet-based um,
Um, so in that case, um, this is just to try to illustrate a little bit about what we do when we try to share resources. And that, that is that we can, we can do it in several uh, different ways. Instead of both parties, A and B, having nine computers by themselves, they can share, if, for instance, if, one, if, if they are in different time zones, they can share on seven common computers and have two of them themselves. They will still have access to nine computers at some part of the day. Or they can scale up and get more or less 16 servers each person part of the whole time. But usually you can find someone else in the day that has not exactly the same kind of usage pattern as your so on. So more or less on demand um, you, you, you can scale for research consumption. So how do we model this? Well, we call this, so we build a common infrastructure. But of course, I won't, if, if some is charging customers one dollar per CPU hour, I don't want some to steal my cycles and have someone else pay for it. Um, likewise, if you would offer these kinds of services, you wouldn't offer them to anyone. You would like to know that if I'm offering storage, it's not shown from over here, it's not shown storage, something that is so uh, well, military research or, or something else that you're opposed to. But if we step back and look at these various um, uh, types of collaboration, the, the same concept arises in that you have across all these organizations, you have people in each organization that sort of they join a club. And that is what we call a virtual organization. And inside this club, you pitch in resources and the tasks that you're doing. And they sort of self-organize the virtual organization on how to solve the problem. Um, so what is the Dota Globus toolkit then? Well, it's a so we most of us have spent much of the uh, many years trying to help these very scientific uh, applications in particular, and uh, sort of realized that we are re reinventing the wheel over and over and over again. Same problems arise all the time. So we try. So the toolkit is really a small collection of pieces of the uh, solutions to pieces of the puzzle. Can't say that. Um, it provides pieces of the public complete puzzle. And, and uh, so we try to introduce a common security infrastructure. We try to introduce common access mechanisms. That's one. And uh, we try to strive to hide all the gory details of, oops, am I running on a Solaris server? Am I running on Linux? Am I running on Windows? Um, by trying to more or less virtualize that away or um, not try to introduce those uh, heterogeneous small details in our protocols and what other kind of details, but very generic components. And uh, we try to follow standards that pass to as much extent as possible. Um, but we can't build one solution to it because everyone else has, either they have already been doing things in this context already, they have some legacy, or they have various ways of looking at, at, at the whole problem and, and they want different, uh, different ways of problem solving it. So if you look at what's done in the internet, well, you have sort of some small pieces in the middle there, you like the IP protocol, and then you have starting to get diversity, and then you have TCP and UDP on top of IP. And then on top of TCP, you have different applications, and up you go. And so that is precisely what we are doing as well. We are 
provide middleware that will provide some core services in the middle um, or the actual resource description and connectivity. And um, we will never jump as far up as actual applications because uh, this is a toolkit and uh, it won't be a turnkey solution because then it will be only a turnkey solution for one particular application. So, this was sort of going fine at, in the beginning. We were a small bunch of crazy people that were hacking day, night, day, day, night and day. Finally, we got something that we could call 1.0, and it was based on whatever we could find out there that sort of fits our, fit, fit our purposes. So we ended up with a floor of different protocols. And then we tried to shoehorn in the common security infrastructure that was better than username password, because username password doesn't fly if you're going to try to manage that across 12 different organizations. Um, you need something, you need a better model. So we have something that we call grid security infrastructure, which is PTI based, so certificates and so on. Um, so you have, we have a single sign-on model where you you uh, sort of log in once and then off, and then uh, uh, the uh, various processes and applications that you start can authenticate as one on your behalf and find their way around in the system. So these components in the, these various uh, protocols, many of them are still in use today. We, um, um, but the, the problem that we, we encountered was that for each new protocol, for each new thing that we wanted to add, it got more and more complicated, for instance, to maintain the common security layer as well. So we, we had to rethink that strategy. And, uh, In the process, this, uh, the, the whole web services uh, stuff came about as well. And we looked at it and realized that actually fits our purposes quite well. Uh, we also got some push from industry. And they said, hey, you're doing quite neat stuff. We want to use your stuff instead of implementing everything on the ourselves. But we have to be able to sell it to customers as well you have to follow standards. So standards become more and more important the more successful you get. And that's also because then, of course, it's not the monoculture anymore, where there is a single de facto standard because there's just a single toolkit. So now we are just a little piece of a big ecosystem. And uh, of course, all the standards doesn't exist. You have to walk around and travel to ITF and Oasis and these various transition bodies and try to settle down things and that's that's a pain so, but it's a um, it's it's a very hard trade off of wanting to do something and push it out the door immediately <coughs> versus someone else also being able to do the same thing. So it's a very hard trade off of when you should sort of try to grind on a big grinder and, and, and uh, try to get something standardized in a big uh, context, or when you should just implement something and push it a bit more. So, grid has sort of been evolving from the fact of standards such as, well, our own home invented protocols or protocol extensions really, into some larger setting where we now have something that we call the Open Grid Services Architecture and there's a bunch of uh, uh, industry and, and academia and so on involved and intelligent people that discuss things in, in uh, big meetings. And uh, so we are somewhat in the beginning of this era. Um, so in terms of the, what 
what you look in the toolkit, if you just download it right now, you will notice that it's a multi-megabyte bunch of software. <coughs> and uh, then you start to look at the various components, and then you get even more scared, because over time, um, you get a lot of stuff there. And, but still, because of backwards compatibility, you can't drop anything that is really fast. So, this whole evolved evolution has caused a plethora of, of various components that we that are all orthogonal or modular and, and for your particular solution you can you can choose some of these various it's a it's a bag of components if you so well. But they have some common structure in them in that they are all part of the same build and packaging. Uh, Philosophy, and uh, you have a common security infrastructure as well. Um, what should I say? Um, we we focus around five really um, or four particular areas: security, data management, execution management, and information service. I'm going to talk about all of these. Um, but of course, we also need to hide, as I said earlier, we need to hide the various uh, in differences that we have on compiling the same software on AIX and Windows and what have you. So we have some common libraries, common runtimes uh, with utility functions and things that actually we have something that we call the globus libc because libc shape is not the same in all human systems. Uh, that's all. So <coughs> last week we shipped the beta final beta we hope of the version 4.0 of the toolkit. And what's new there is that we have sort of made a transition for real to the web services world. And we introduced something that we call the web services resource framework, where all the various grid resources that I talked about, if they are instruments, they are computers, they are storage. Um, we, uh, we model them as web services resources, which means that they all have a little element in there that is called, you know, called resource properties that explain what they are, what they do, and that you can um, query, you can subscribe to notifications about changes of these properties, and you um, swap. And this has helped a lot in the implementation of, of creating these distributed systems. So there are several implementations of this framework already. Java C, Python.net, and uh, it's still better, as I said, but it, it, things are looking. Uh, much better than the previous version, which was Global well, 3, which was more or less the first approach to do something in the web services world. Well. And that was probably more or less a disaster uh, for performance and, and, and usability. For it. So, um, what we had. We provide not only toolkits, we also provide a development and hosting environment. And in the uh, in for web services, we in, we offer both a Java and a C hosting environment. There's a the Java stuff is more or less only Apache access. So if you and and, and, and uh, similar um, related. Apache products. So much of what we have done has been uh, ported straight back into Apache or been, been done as part of the Apache product. But then we also uh, put these 
modules into, some of them are quite complex to use. We put them into a common framework, some simplified wrappers on top of it so that you don't get completely gray hair. And, uh, and uh, this should make it reasonably easy to create your own grid services. Um, so, I'm going to switch a little bit and talk a little bit more about the various four fields that we, that we specialize in. The most important, really, thing when you want to do these kinds of cross organization and distributed platforms is the security. If you don't have a good security model, the system administrator won't install the software here. Also, you, know, you have the problem that you cannot have something like username, password, something simple as that. First, because the same username, trying to organize a namespace with the same usernames and all across organizations is hard. It's not possible. Um, furthermore, you want to have this to scale. We have thousands of users, but perhaps only 10 or 20 of them access your particular resource at a time. That means you shouldn't have this shouldn't have to offer it or, or reserve some UID space on several thousand people. So yet you want some more dynamic mapping into, into your local um, space and some sandboxing. So if a user is going to run 10,000 jobs, of course he cannot do it alone. He needs, he needs computers to do that for him. So there will be so typically, a user will use a uh, start up something from his laptop and then go online. So somewhere we need something that runs and monitors some kind of rotary or, or other uh, task queues or what, what have you that are empowered to act on behalf of the user so that when they go to a resource somewhere, they will get the same access and uh, and so on that the normal user would, even though the user may not be involved in it, may not be online anymore. So as I said before, we use PDI for this, and we use delegation to say that uh, a certain process may be act, may, may be allowed to act on my behalf but under these certain certain circumstances and so on. Um, then we just use normal, uh, normal standards. Uh, but then finally, as I said before as well, the resource doesn't want just anyone to access these resources. But rather, I will service these various communities for virtual organizations is another word for it. And they in turn will decide who are part of their particular community. And this is sort of how you Get how you enable scale. So the resource will have to track some 10 or 15 or whatever different computer communities. Inside each community, you might have, might have 100 users, and they will come and go and come and go. But uh, um, yeah, this is not easy. So I guess, did you 
um, define GCP buffer sizes, uh, multiple parallel streams, and striping across multiple servers that will each push as much data as they can from disk, which is usually like 100 megabytes per second. And thanks to this, you can actually fill up the 30 gigabit per second um, fiber across the wide area if you want to. Of course, you have to be a little bit careful. There was a, there was a, uh, the, the guys at CERN who were trying things out with a storage, uh, big storage element, storage facility at the UK. And the uh, UK emergency response unit, they thought that they were being attacked by a huge DOS attack because all of a sudden the whole gigabit fiber to UK was flooded. And it was all going to one single host in the UK. Um, so sometimes you have to be a little bit careful what you do or let the incident, incident response teams know ahead of time what you're, that you're eventually going to do things like this. Uh, similarly, databases is another concern. Um, you have MySQL, you have Postgres, you have Oracle, and so on. You have uh, many different representations. You have flat files. And still, you have these, um, say, 50 different sources of, uh, well, it could be, for instance, uh, some medical journal uh, data. And now some doctors want to take part of all these various medical journals and do a epidemiological study. Now, because of legal reasons and a lot of other possible reasons, they are not allowed to assemble all of these data into a central data. So you have to have these distributed uh, and uh, distributed queries that also take into account that various sources are heterogeneous. So that is in terms of access and, and pushing bits around. But once you have done it, well, you don't want to push push your gigabit or gigabyte data sets around. So you need to know, remember, well, I copied it from there to there. I should remember that I have those two copies, but I might make a replica of my uh, data set. And you want to be able to remember where they are, what, um, and, and uh, so that you can, you can also associate uh, attributes with these data sets so that, you can, that the applications can use. And uh, you can also have logical data sets, which is a collection of hundreds of small files. And whenever you re replicate them, the logical data set, all 100 files, will move over, over the back. Uh, then, for the tax, yeah, so as I said, I mentioned the grid and the P already. And then there is the sort of a, something we call reliable file transfer, which is that you don't have to be online in order to move these large sets around. You let the service do that for you, which we call reliable file transfer. And it will also do necessarily free price and so on. And this is tightly coupled into the execution management so that you um, coordinate the traffic stage. As I said before, even though we have all these things, it's often not enough to build a full-scale application. So what we have is a ecosystem that it, it helped, developed or evolved over the year. And uh, you see, there, this is just a uh, bunch of different tools and packaging efforts and Yeah. yeah, that all sort of build on top of GT. And uh, this has been reasonably successful, I have to say. <coughs> so,
So, now you may ask yourself, so this is all good and fine for you guys that are giving these 1,000 user communities distributed analysis kinds of things, but what's in it for me? Well, you don't have to scale it up to those sizes. It can still be of use, especially if you're writing any distributed application, uh, for instance, the service development comes the hosting service Hosting environments that we um, offer in the area industry. There's some, something in, in this whole thing for many people that are doing distributed stuff. Um, so just be aware that we exist, and when the day comes and you're, you're talk, tasked with doing something similar, just remember that we exist and that. Uh, we are always on the lookout for additional new collaborators. Uh, we have an online community. We have a discuss list with some thousand plus active members. There's a developer discuss, which is a little bit more than 100. Uh, there are some uh, early adopters, friendly users, mailing list for the latest release. Uh, we have a very recent uh, so something that people always pick on in documentation was doesn't matter how much you plan for it, documentation is the last thing that the developer writes. Um, and so there's a documentation project in place, and this is also this is also meant to be sort of the when the system administrator writes for the system administrator instead of having the developer writing for the system administrator. Um, and these kinds of things. There's a really good tutorial there on uh, developing your own service developed by a Spanish guy. And uh, it's very new though, so still, but it's there. And the tool itself is having lots of documentation always, although that can always improve. As I was reminded last night, uh, we should add this, we should add a a small warning here that if this sounds a little bit interesting to you and you try to download the tool to be prepared that this is more than a 15 minute exercise. It's not just configure make make and so on. For starters, you have to get those certificates and so on. We try to make this simpler. So we have this facility for where you can just go and uh, get, get these kinds of well, the necessary. Uh, play around with certificates and so on. Um, we have collaborators providing binary RPMs and so on, but uh, things can always improve. But uh, yes, don't give up and, and plan for more than 15 minutes if you want to do these things. Uh, we always welcome feedback in terms of Web reports, uh, improvement requests, and uh, well, we we, uh, we 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 welcome discomforting feedback as well. But it, hopefully, with with some suggestion on how to solve the problem, just just not just say that you said. Um, we always encourage collaboration. Let us know that you are out there and let us know what ideas you have. And we will be happy to talk to you and make this a bigger effort. That's, I guess, all I have. Are there any questions? Yes. Any plans for the fourth term run back? Wow. Um, no, I'll add it.
You don't need to compile it within particular libraries and so on. All you need to do then is to provide the executable for the environment in which you're going to run. So if you want to access both Solaris and Linux boxes, you would have to provide a, a Solaris executable and a Linux executable. And uh, then you can just use not ordinary command line tools to do actual staging and everything. Yes? The age group is for more uh, firewall friendly. Well, it was for more firewall friendly. Um, Firewalls are always tough when you want to do distributed systems. First of all, um, if there is a policy that you shouldn't have any inbound or outbound connections, <laughs> then we shouldn't try to circumvent that. But we have some, uh, uh, we have some, well, first of all, things, more and more of the traffic is now going across a single port with the transition to web services. Um, we still have the old that you can specify that the uh, you specify an, an environment, environment variable that will restrict the <coughs> services to only use a certain range for range in a, for a different area of course. Um, but uh, we do have things so that we can, uh, you can you can define well my my IP number has happens to be one nine two one six eight whatever because we're active and then we can define so that all that page, all the services will pick up and display sort of the proper external name of, of the quick where to find the service so that you have and so on. But ultimately I mean if you have a completely closed down environment, you need to open up for something. There are there is a in collaboration with a with some guys in Amsterdam, there's an effort where we try to make a dynamic connectivity provisioning service so that you would effectively ask something that is in control programmatically and say, well, here I am, I provide you with all the credentials uh, so that you would then open up on a per need basis. Um, now, if you ask the system administrators, you get two camps. One that says, this is exactly what I want, and the other says, no chance in hell I will give you your software access to my route. But, but you can play other tricks with this, or you can just yes, IP tables on the on the local machines. Thanks to the Is it easier to prototype and to to try to use blockers and the next to put in the production? For example, if we have a proprietary data in our service, and I am not able to open my firewall just to open it. Um, but then you have to think of <coughs> other other means of uh, uh, demilitarized zone or something where you can offer services to the external collaborator in, in, a, in a still a, a secure way. Other questions? Yeah, we, yeah. Is this a single network or just uh, different islands using the same uh, uh, This is different islands, most definitely. Uh, yes, you could establish a VPN among all of these different uh, players, but uh, that won't fly immediately at all sense because the same resource may be consumed by several different communities, and then the different communities will all have. Either you would have to establish a VPN with each of them, or so that's not really a test. It works in business environment, um, where you have more or less static five partners uh, kind of settings. Uh, yeah. I could also add that, uh, yeah, because this is a toolkit, like these islands are more domain, like a few different choices how to implement, how to use the tool in different ways. So uh, not only like several different islands.
analysis also that not all the items are exactly compatible. Yeah. <coughs> How many items Thank you. 